Zach, if you were stuck on a desert island and it was just you and a pig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us on the PBN podcast, Zach. What a pleasure to finally <laughs> sit down with you, my friend. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So before we get started and talk about all the incredible things you've been doing with your life in recent years, tell us your vegan story. How did it, where did you discover the lifestyle? Because that's really what brought us together. Yeah. Um, so I've been vegan for about four and a half years, something like that. Um, I became vegan when a friend of mine, uh, Timmy, went vegan. And he was bombarding me and my friendship group with, uh, you know, arguments <laughs> for veganism. And at first, you know, I was, I was like, nah, this guy's so annoying. Like, I don't like any of these arguments. And I was definitely like um, uh, speaking the argument against veganism. And it just got to the point when I, I, where I ran out of good arguments. Uh, it, it was specifically like the ethical argument uh, for veganism, i.e. the suffering of animals. I just couldn't think of any more justifications for that. And at that point, I was like, right, well, I better act on uh, the way I actually mm. uh, think about this. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was it. I just, uh, yeah, just slowly started to introduce um, vegan products into, into, my, into my life. So whether that was replacing milk for oat milk in, in the morning um, and then, yeah, just slowly but surely kind of making that transition. How did he convince you? Did he show you a documentary? Did he? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I watched um, Cowspiracy, mm -hmm. um, and that was really effective in kind of just getting me to think about it from many, many different angles. Whether it was the environmental angle, the the ethical angle, or the health angle. Mm -hmm. To me, the the most motivating one was the the ethical, mm -hmm. uh, the ethical angle, um, and it's still the thing that you know when inevitably during the the process of becoming vegan, you will mess up. Mm. Um, but it's the thing that's kept me kind of going back to it mm. and, and trying my best. And you talked about the, the ethical side. How was your relationship growing up with animals and the sort of the animal kingdom? Were you aware hmm. of them out there as individuals or were you like most people, you know, consuming animals, but not really thinking about it? Were you sort of awakened to that at all as a child? Um, I think I like I, I remember walking past a farm like where there were these cows just kind of grazing. And, and I, I remember always wanting to like interact with the cows and like feed them leaves and stuff. And like always, I, I, I felt a lot of like- mm. uh, Empathy. Empathy. Um, and I wanted to connect with them. I think I, I didn't um, associate, you know, the actual being with, with the meat for, for a long time. Um, so I, I ate steak mm. so much growing up. Um, <laughs> As do most men. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's what men do, apparently. <laughs> it's what we do. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think it was quite shocking for my mum who, you know, would have cooked, I don't know, meat for me three or four times a week. Min mm. Like I always had meat and, mm. and I ate pretty much everything. And I didn't go from, um, you know, being a meat eater to then vegetarian and then vegan. I just went. Pardon the pun, cold turkey. Cold tofu. Cold tofu. <laughs> as, Jess, <laughs> as Jesse J said on, on, the, on the last nice. interview, which made me chuckle. Cold tofu. Yeah. Cold, cold tofu. It's such like a strange it. thing, isn't it? That we, you know, we're born in this world where we have things placed on our plate every day as a, ch as a child or as a young adult. Mm. And we don't think about it. We don't question it. Um, we trust our family yeah. to be nourishing us with the best possible foods. But there are some children who reject it from a very young age. Right, right, right. They somehow intrinsically know, I'm not sure how, but they know that, that what they're eating are their animal friends and they don't want to do it and they reject it. Right, right. And they become vegetarian at like age three or four, which I find remarkable. Yeah, that um, is. Do you, think, do you think there's a correlation between, you know, um, our sort of relationship with animals and our sort of attitude towards food? Because I feel like, you know, carnism, have you heard of carnism? No, what's that? So carnism, carnism was this term coined by Dr. Melanie Joy, who's a, an American psychologist. And she talked about carnism being a dominant ideology that exists on earth today. And veganism is the counterculture to carnism. Right. And carnism is a belief system, like veganism is a belief system. Mm -hmm. But carnism is invisible because we don't know it's there. We don't see it. We take for granted that when the food is put in front of us, that we're taught that it's normal needed and necessary to consume it. If we don't eat it, we'll die. Right, right, That's right. what we're taught, right? Uh -huh. 
but we know that's a lie. Seven years vegan here, four years you, right? And yeah, yeah. and we've we're still standing. Yeah. So this belief system that opposes veganism called carnism, right, pervades our life. It's ubiqu uh, it's ubiquitous. Everywhere you see, there's TV ads, there's billboards. Mm -hmm. It's almost sort of forced down our throats. Right. And we've we're, we're our, our culture is sort of primarily carnistic. Right. And but the mechanism behind that is is that it it sort of it de not dehumanizes, but it de individualizes animals. And when you eat, yep. see the steak on the plate, mm. you don't see it as an animal. No, you see it as a piece of meat. Yeah, uh, an object. Mm -hmm. In your mind, you know, how did you move from that young man who ate so much steak to suddenly seeing animals? Was there a shift? Do you remember a shift or? Um, yeah, I, I think for me the process was a, a, a logical one. Right. Um, like a, it was a, it was purely like. I had obviously it was informed by empathy and emotion, but at the same time it was a it was a rational thing where I was like, okay, I, I, I can see this is wrong, and I can't justify doing it anymore. Mm. And if I do continue to to eat meat, then I'm doing myself a disservice. Mm. I'm not respecting my own logic, and so it was it was also kind of like a a self esteem thing where I was like, okay, if if I don't actually act on this, how can I? So it's not self esteem, self respect thing. Mm. How, how can I respect my own mind mm. if I've, you know, been given this information? I've made a decision and I don't actually go with it. Mm. Um, yeah, it was a an intelligent choice. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it really is. Once you're presented with the information, I know no human being wants to knowingly cause suffering, right? Unless you're a psychopath, which of course is like. 0.1% of the population or something like that. Don't quote me on that. Don't don't come for me on Twitter. I'm going to have to quote you on that. <laughs> which I've, which, which I've had this week. I've had a few people coming for me for some of my quotes. So I need to be careful what I say. Um, but at the same time, you know, human beings are, I believe, human beings are innately compassionate. Okay. That it's the seed of compassion lives within, within all of us. But if it's not watered, it doesn't flourish. And we'll get into men and our challenges with compassion and empathy in mm -hmm. a bit but mm -hmm. you know that that compassion was in you and it yeah. was watered by the nourishing support and wisdom of your friend yeah and it awakened within you mm. and logic and reason and emotion came together mm -hmm. which gave birth to this realization mm. that animals do not deserve to be killed the way they are killed and suffer the way they right. suffer mm -hmm. because of your choices yeah and here we are. You, here we are. As a, as a vegan man, living, yeah. your, living your life, living your best life. <laughs> <laughs> Live my best life. That's right. So it's a beautiful thing. Um, and I'm constantly inspired by, you know, young men like you who are challenging the status quo out mm. there in the world. Because obviously this whole idea of manliness is deeply entwined with eating meat. Mm -hmm. And that there's this sort of like masculine quality that people feel, young men feel that if they don't eat meat, then they're not masculine and they're not mm. a man. Mm -hmm. Again, we'll go back into this. I want to go. Yeah, I want to stay. I want to stay in the past and let's let's talk a bit about your your history. Mm. Um, you were you are half Moroccan, half mm. English. Um, mm. What was it like growing up in the UK, being a little bit different? Did you were you treated any differently? Did you have you know um, cultural differences that made it a little bit harder for you? I mean, if I'm honest, not really. Um, so my, I, I would say, I'm, so I'm, I'm Jewish. Um, mm. Both my both my parents mm. uh, come from Jewish backgrounds. Mm. And I would say that if anything, that was the thing which kind of differentiated me in, mm. in one of the schools I went to. Mm -hmm. I was one of three Jewish people mm. at the school. Um, and, and so, yeah, I did get treated a little bit differently. There'd be a few comments here and there. But if, if I'm honest, I've been quite lucky in that mm. I haven't um, I haven't been discriminated against mm. um, based on uh, my my family's ethnicity. Mm. You got out you got out unscathed. I did, yeah, yeah. It it can be a real um, format. It is format the formative years of our lives at school where mm. our identity begins to take shape, doesn't it? <clears throat> yeah, and we start to figure out who we are, whether it's our gender, our identity, our sexuality, you know, our ethnicity. Mm -hmm. You know, kids always find a way to find something about you that yeah. they can just pull apart and yeah. like tear you to shreds in some way. Yeah. Um, but I also think that that's, I think that's kids, although it's horrible yeah. in the moment, mm. that is um, kids' ways of like figuring out what's what and mm. what's acceptable and mm. what's- Pushing what's boundaries. Not. Yeah, mm. you know, because I think all of us as human beings, we're trying to figure out our place in the world and we're trying to understand 
you know, what, what is a good way to be or an acceptable way to be. And in order to find out that information, we have to test the boundaries mm -hmm. and we have to prod a little bit and be like, Ooh, if I act like this, how will you react? Mm -hmm. And will you like me if, if I act in this way? And that's an, and also if I'm mean to you, will that, you know, get me to a higher place in the social hi hierarchy? Like, the school is, is where you find out those 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 things and you mm. and you figure out the, the social dynamics mm. that are at play. Um, what were you like at school? Were you the tough kid or were you oh the man. geek or were you the? I, I was so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who remembers me, mm. I was like smarty pants. I, I was I was I was a know it all, um, mm. and I was really annoying. <laughs> I was really cocky as well. You knew everything. I mean, I was like above like slightly above average in mm -hmm. terms of like academia mm -hmm. so there were people way smarter than me yeah. i wasn't like like uh behind in class or anything but the, i think the i was also a class clown so i i think in year six i got sent out 40 percent of the time mm. per day, like in, in a given wow. day so i i spent like my my most common memory of, of year six is standing outside the classroom looking at the wall in the corridor waiting to to be told off by the teacher um i don't know why i was so naughty i just maybe rule, that was, you were always a rule breaker i was the one trying to figure out the rules mm -hmm. and just been like oh what can i get away with um i was trying to figure out my place in the are you world. still like that now yeah <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, i suppose i'm a bit more uh subtle about it mm, yeah i think that's interesting to hear because i think you know at school there's always an opportunity to figure out who we are and I, sometimes i think people do take it in different directions and sometimes people stay in the middle right where they mm. keep safe and keep their heads down but um yeah it's interesting yeah, to I, was, I wasn't like that mm. um i think I, I was also quite like um i really wanted validation from others at school mm. um i think it's because i didn't have a lot in in some ways like maybe up to the age of 12 i had a lot of confidence mm. and then i think when everyone started going through puberty i was like quite a late bloomer mm. and so i think my self-esteem was affected by that and mm. so subconsciously for, for a long time i kind of was i would act in a certain way to try and get a reaction mm. whether that was trying to make someone laugh trying to make them annoyed just something to to get attention mm. and and feel important to be seen yeah to mm. be seen and so that's probably why i was so annoying mm. um and uh yeah i try not to be too annoying these days <laughs> we talked a little bit earlier about um kind of parenting and mm. you know growing up you grew up in London right and to a single mum you, you yeah. lost your dad quite young that's right yeah how did that affect you as a young man and your sort of identity you know in mm. this world how did it sort of shape who you are um I I think I developed a lot of like empathy just because my mum has a mm. lot of empathy and is always thinking about other people so that kind of uh, that trait was kind of instilled into me mm. um there are traits that i remember my father having which i don't really have a lot of now um and it's probably because i, I wasn't around him from my life mm. um and i wonder it's so difficult to know how i would have ended up if, mm. if i was uh, surrounded by a mum and a dad um it's impossible to say really mm. um but yeah i, I definitely I miss kind of having a, a permanent male role model in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I was very fortunate in that I, uh, I, I used to play table tennis quite, uh, quite well. Mm -hmm. um, and um, quite well. Quite, yeah. <laughs> so I used to play for England. Mm -hmm. uh, I was ranked number one in. Don't in leave tennis. that out. But, yeah. <laughs> that was what I thought I was going to do before music. Wow. Um, and my table tennis coach, a guy called Ellie Barati, mm -hmm. kind of acted as that that father figure for me. Mm. Um, you must have been lean AF because that is like I was an pretty intense lean. game. I was pretty lean. Um, You're still pretty lean. I mean, uh, <laughs> I've, I've, I've changed slightly. In bit of lockdown love, but yeah, so we, we've all love. got it. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he kind of acted as, as that father figure and ro male role Amazing. model to me, which, which, which was really useful. Mm. Even if it's just subconsciously to be like, okay, I'm exposed to to this man and he acts in this way. And yeah. that's interesting. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's a, a way that I can act if I want to. Just mm -hmm. having that exposure um, and having a deep connection with someone who's male mm -hmm. um, and a bit older than you, mm -hmm. I think is really useful um, in those formative years to, to give you the, the, 
the choice mm -hmm. to 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 take in the world in, in the way that they see the world. Mm. Um, it is interesting. There, there's so many parallels in in all the men that I know who've been brought up by single mums. Mm. Sensitive, gentle, right, emotive, empathetic. Mm. Um, it can't be. It can't be a. Um, well, it's anecdotal, of course. Yeah. It could be an accident. It, it could be an accident of the people that I've met because maybe I'm drawn to that those type of people because I'm that type of person, sensitive, emotion, emotional, empathetic. But there is this sort of correlation between young men that I know who've been brought up by mums or you know, their mums and their sisters, mm. very, very sensitive and gentle and sort of there's a softness about them. Right. But then a lot of the time where there's more masculine, um, uh, more masculine what's the word energy energy in a family the men are a little harder a little tougher a little stronger in the sense of stronger as in like very unemotional <clears throat> their right. emotional intelligence seems very very low mm. um, and their ability to feel empathy or to connect with people in a compassionate way seems lower mm. and i'm so fascinated in the balance between the masculine and the feminine mm. that, and they, these things exist in all of us don't they it's kind of like these energies that that kind of flow through us and i do believe that in our sort of modern world, many men block the feminine side of themselves. They repress it, they push it down because they're afraid of it ultimately. They're afraid of being feminine or feeling feminine or looking feminine or acting mm. feminine in any way, whatever that means, whether that's how you dress, how you wear your hair, how you talk, how you walk. Mm. Um, we're so heavily conditioned as men and women to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. And that if you fall anywhere in the middle, you're a freak, you're you're gay, you're, mm. you're this, you're that. There's all these slurs that people use um and you know the power of that sort of you know culture mm. creates a lot of unhappiness and a yeah. lot of yeah. uncertainty for a lot of young people yeah because you know we are not we do not exist in no matter what you know the hard right conservative types will tell you there are not two genders there aren't because you know i am myself non-binary i consider myself in the middle mm. i don't feel very masculine and i don't feel very feminine Right. I sit in this sort of no, ma no man's, no person's land <laughs> in the middle. See, it's even in our language, right? Yeah, 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 the sort yeah. of gender genderist. But mm. anyway, as you've grown, obviously, as a man and, and you've explored your identity, you know, and into your music, which we'll talk about in a sec, you know, there seems to be a desire to express yourself in a way that is connected with emotion and mm. and mind and and sort of thought. Right. How you know, is this a recent thing or is this something you've always had in your music where you sing and talk about important things that matter, like, you know, being kind, like being, you know, being true to yourself by mm -hmm. being, you know, am I less of a man? One of your mm -hmm. recent songs. Is this a new thing or is this something you've always thought about? Well, I mean, firstly, that was well said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it is something that I've often thought about, um, especially with less of a man. Mm -hmm. I think, like, like I said, when I was, 12 or so and like from 12 to 16 I was a really late bloomer and so when all of the other guys would have you know got really hairy and bigger and stronger um it took me a while to to kind of grow up in that respect mm. and I often then thought you know does I just didn't feel like a manly man mm. or whatever that is like right. um I, I wasn't I wasn't in line with the the general uh, how, how most men were growing up and that really kind of played on my my self-esteem mm. and you my, didn't think you were manly enough no uh, and and the, the the like okay the the factors that I was thinking about were okay how tall am I mm. how strong am I mm. um how successful am I mm. with women um so coming from a very heteronormative perspective mm. um you know how much money do I have and, mm. and things like that and 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 that that was like like I was talking about before with being in school that was me trying to figure out mm -hmm. my place in the world and my place as a man in the world and it just it really kind of got me thinking and, and I and I have been I think over the past few years there's been a lot of discussion on gender especially online and, and it's really like it's, it's made me think mm. Um, and it's been really amazing to have, you know, a different perspective, um, challenging, my, you know, the, the, the world's perspective mm. and, and the way that society has existed for so long. Mm. Um, and I found it really fascinating to, to explore that and 
And I was literally like, I, I told you earlier, like talking to my friend about mm. uh, this and, until like the early hours mm. uh, last night, because it's, it's still something which I'm learning about and will continue to learn about, I'm sure, mm. for the rest of my life. It is fascinating. And I think there's this perception that, you know, being male or female, masculine or feminine mm. <clears throat> is a binary. You're one or the other, mm. full stop. Um, people also don't know the difference between sex and gender. Mm. You're assigned sex at birth by mm. the doctor. Right. But a lot of the time, the doctor doesn't know what's going on inside your body. And you also have intersex people yep. who have both sexual organs sometimes. And so what is their sex? Mm. It's a little bit of both. And then in the old days, um, a person's sex was assigned by the doctor and they may chop off bits of the baby yeah, yeah. Um, without really allowing the child or the person to grow up and figure out who they are. Mm -hmm. They don't do that anymore in many countries, thankfully. It right. caused a lot of suffering and yeah. suicide and, and unhappiness. But the difference between sex and gender is so important. And I believe we need to teach our children. Well, people are trying to teach our children, but the very hard you know, conservative right types in, in the world are very against it because they feel like what they, what, which, what the liberal left are trying to do is erase gender. Mm. We're not trying to do that. The irony is we're trying to open it up. We're right. trying to say to people that you can be non-binary and you can mm. still be attracted to women. I've right. got friends who are non-binary and they they are heterosexual. Right. Right. Sexuality and gender are not Interconnect, can interconnected, they are separate. Can I ask you a question on that? Because, yeah. like I said, it's st still think something I'm learning about yeah. now. So, if someone identifies as non-binary, yeah, and they're also heterosexual, yeah, is that their sex uh, being attracted to someone of the opposite sex? Is that the way it's looked at? It's an interesting question. I would say your gender is your identity, who you see yourself as, how you express yourself, how yep. you present yourself, yep. how you think, how you feel, your emotions, mm -hmm. the way you interact with others, um, your, your place in the world. Whereas yep. your sexuality, it is that urge, that physical animality mm -hmm. that connects you to another person sexually. It's that, yep. it's that kind of carnal instinct that you have. Mm -hmm. They are obviously there are connections there but generally they are pretty separate because mm -hmm. you can be a transgender person yeah. born female become a male mm -hmm. and still be attracted to women and so you become lesbian you become gay mm -hmm. whereas when you were born you were born a woman you become a man um, but you're still attracted to women you know what I mean people assume yeah. that if you're born a woman you become a transgendered man you'll automatically be attracted just to the opposite gender but you might be attracted to the same gender that your sexuality yeah. is is a bit like something that exists within you but it is also a spectrum for sure that it's not just one or the other that it's a, it's, it's fluid it, yeah i get that and, and that makes that makes complete sense like if someone uh is pansexual pansexual th then they're open to, to anyone any, right okay. yeah but you just said that someone who is non-binary mm. can be heterosexual they can so or bisexual or gay or pansexual when i think of um the term uh in in uh, relation to someone's sexuality, say it's heterosexual. Mm -hmm. That's that is in my mind saying someone of one gender is attracted to someone of the opposite gender. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So how does that work with non-binary? If you're almost if you identify as somewhere in between, or but so it's you're probably you're, you're attracted to someone of the opposite sex, not gender. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So so yeah. It, it, it applies to sex in, yeah. in that respect. Okay. Yeah, because the body. Right. Okay. You're when you think about what you're attracted to when you look at a woman, it's her body, uh -huh. her mind, maybe the way she moves. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. If you met a trans woman, yeah, it, you'll be attracted to all the same things. Yeah. The physicality of a person. Yeah. The way they speak, the way they move, the way they dress, the way they smell. Mm -hmm. Whereas gender, it's kind of irrelevant, right? What the person's gender is. Well, well, no, this is the thing. If, if someone um, identifies as transgender, mm -hmm. um, say someone is a trans woman and they're with someone who identifies as male, mm -hmm. I think they would be a bit offended if, if the man said that they're gay mm -hmm. because they're like, well, no, you're saying that I'm a man. That doesn't, that doesn't, I don't identify as a man. Mm. So they would be straight in that respect. It's interesting the so word. So it applies to gender in that respect as opposed to sex. It's really complicated because obviously the word transgender has the word gender in it. Yes. It, you know, in a way it's sort of like trans sex because you are, you're, you are moving, you are moving both, well, not moving, but you are returning to, or at a re, it's probably a better word to say realigning. 
right. you're realigning your sex and your gender. Right. Because, but the gender is the expression. Because yep. when you have the gender reassignment surgery, you can then start to express yourself, right. express your gender in the way that makes you feel who you really are. Right. So you create this realignment, whereas people who are transgender are often born totally out of alignment, mm -hmm. physically, the way yeah. they express themselves, everything. And that's what causes the suffering. Yeah. But non-binary is a kind of catch-all term, really. It's not like a thing. It's not like a badge. It's mm -hmm. sort of this place in between where it doesn't have... Non-binary is actually not a label. <laughs> right. But, but then may, maybe, and um, I'd love to know what you think, wouldn't, wouldn't it be a better idea to not use terms like heterosexual and, and homosexual? Absolutely. When you introduce uh, ideas, not, uh, when, when someone identifies as uh, non-binary, mm. wouldn't it be better not to have those kind of labels which are um, related to sex, mm, mm -hmm. as in uh, not as in gender sex, as opposed to Definitely. action sex. Well, that's the that's the that's the action sex. That's the <laughs> <laughs> wow, I never thought I'd be saying Coined. this today. <laughs> I you mean, have action sex. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, language is so yeah. fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, and, and you know, it's evolving all the time. Over in France at the moment, in French, in the French language, there's he and she, mm -hmm. um, and there are no terms for non-binary people that's in right. between. And then the, the hard right conservative types in, in France are very angry about the changing the language, liberal left trying yeah, to create yeah, yeah, yeah. space yeah. for people like me in the yeah. middle with mm -hmm. pronouns and they don't want it because yeah. they're trying to maintain the purity of the language. Yeah. It's a very dangerous language to say that type of thing because what you're trying to essentially do is hold back evolution. Human beings are evolving mm -hmm. and changing all the time. Physically, our society is evolving, our language is evolving. That's one of the beautiful things about English is that it's a polymorphic language. It's always evolving. That's it's absorbing right. yeah. new words yeah, yeah. and it's changing and adapting all the time. And to be honest, you know, English doesn't really belong to any one country. People speak it across the planet mm. and it is open to change. And I think that's why it's so widely adopted because it is so adaptable. You only really need to know very few words to be able to communicate with another person in English. Whereas like Latin languages, you need like 5,000 or something. Yeah, <laughs> not, not really. Well, but it's probably so widely adopted just because <laughs> English people try to make people speak well English. imperialism obviously yeah. colonialism <laughs> played probably... a huge role in it of course but well, i mean as in like it's it's but adopted no, and saying. maintained yeah, yeah. it's also like a, a language that you know is a bridge between different peoples yeah but anyway going off on a tangent <laughs> yeah. there but you know english yeah sorry language is evolving yeah, yeah, yeah. and and the way we talk about people the way we talk about each other needs to evolve and we shouldn't hold back on it because at the end of the day it's a bit like with gay marriage mm. a lot of people are up in arms about gay marriage i'm like well if you don't like gay gay marriage don't get gay married you know <laughs> like why allow yeah. other people why allow uh, you know why why sort of enforce your your views your world views on minorities or other people who just want to live their lives yeah and ultimately the way and like pro, let's talk about pronouns for example when mm. you say to a person what are your pronouns yeah, what would yeah. you how would you like me to refer to you that's mm. a very polite and compassionate thing to do mm. but yet there are many people out there who are outraged by the idea of asking a person what their pronouns are it's a very simple thing to do hello mm. what's your name i'm zach what are your pronouns what are your pronouns uh, he him he him thank you zach and so I know, and, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Mm. Um, but there's a lot of people who fight that. They don't like the idea. But I think, you know, going a little deeper into this, I think there's this fear that men are losing their masculinity, mm. that the heterosexual cisgendered male is losing a grip on, you know, the, the sort of, you know, the stronghold of, you know, their identity. And you understand there's like, you know, there's a Jordan Peterson types out there who, mm who are big on talking about this and mm. you know many people like him talk about how you know masculinity is being eroded <clears throat> men are being emasculated do you believe that do you think that do you think men are losing their masculinity and if they are is that a bad thing uh i think both things are happening so i think on the one hand um there are the people that you were talking about uh in the middle of you know hyper masculine hyper feminine not hyper but like very masculine very feminine where they don't have to question their place in the universe mm -hmm. um and the suffering of those people i'd say i'd include myself in that mm. people who um didn't feel like they fitted in um with how most men act right. and the the um the 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 feeling of oh i'm different that suffering 
I suppose, less of a man was to address that feeling. Mm. Um, and so some attention needs to be spent on the, the people who don't... Um, Fit on either side. Yeah. And, and, and just in terms of like, femininity and masculinity in that spectrum mm. um but then at the same time there'll be there's there's it's a spectrum where mm. you you also don't want to stop yourself from um having things like accountability and responsibility mm. um which at the moment have been classed as masculine traits mm. when really I, I feel like they're just good traits human yeah mm. um and so i think there's an element of truth in in both sides in that we should be encouraging good traits which coincidentally have been classed as masculine traits i don't think that traits should be classed as masculine or feminine regardless of whether most men have acted this way historically or most women have acted this way historically um, but I think, yeah, there, there's kind of, I noticed it, uh, sorry if this is like a bit convoluted. No, not at all. I'm just, I'm just unlocking. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. So I, I think I noticed it mostly in the mental health conversation. So a lot of the things that you see online are about how, if you're going through a difficult time, speak up, mm. you know, and reach out for help. And, um, you know, what you're feeling is, is, is totally fine mm -hmm. and it's not it's not your fault there's nothing you can do about it kind of thing and sometimes that perspective is useful um and let's say historically that would have been seen as the the nurturing feminine energy mm -hmm. right which is I, i'm going to take care of you and and it's whatever you're feeling is okay mm -hmm. right and some like sometimes that is appropriate mm -hmm. but sometimes actually the best solution to your mental health issue that, that one might be experiencing mm -hmm. is responsibility, figuring things out for yourself and acquiring a level of self-esteem based on the fact that you feel as though you can trust your own mind. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, my old coach, Eli Barati, I told him I was going through a difficult time. And previously, whenever I had told someone I'm going through a difficult time, they were like, oh man, Ran up or something. no, no, no. Right. They were like, I'm, I'm so sorry to right. hear that. Like I'm here to, to talk That's amazing. If, if you want. And I'm like, ah, oh, thank, thanks so much. And, and, and it was brilliant, mm. but I was still messed up. Mm. And actually this is purely anecdotal, sure. but the most useful thing for me was to hear my table tennis coach be like, mate, I'm, I'm actually tired of, of hearing you say that you're you're fucked up at the moment. And w what are you going to do to change your situation? Mm. And I'm like, why, oh, man? Like, why are you why are you being like that? Like, yeah. he's, he's like, what what do you want me to do? Mm. And and that that pers and and I was like, well, I, I don't know. Like, I want to, you know, I'm feeling really down, and I'm I'm, I'm worried about this and that. He's mm. like, okay, what can you do that's in your control? Mm. And he, he was like, who's in control here? And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I don't know. There's just things going on. He's like, who's in control? I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in control. Wow. I'm in control. I, I, I can change my circumstances here. He's like, okay, mm. fucking change it. You know, and, and that, that perspective would be something that I'm sure the Jordan Peterson and, and kind of more right-wing people would be a fan of. Mm. It's not very popular at the moment, but it's something which within the mental health discussion is a useful mm. thing to, to also factor in mm. and a tool to, to include when you're thinking about, you know, what is the appropriate response to someone who's going through a tough time? Mm. Previously, it was always stiff up a lip and, yeah. and just get on with it and, and plow it. through, right? Mm. And there'll be many reasons as to why that maybe, maybe we were in more wartime previously and, and that was you know, the best thing that could have been done for like survival of- Stoicism. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but right now I feel like there is um, quite rightly so, maybe slightly an overcorrection mm -hmm. on, you know, it's okay what you're experiencing. I'm here to talk kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. That was where the majority of attention should have been spent. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy mm -hmm. that that is happening right now. Mm -hmm. At the same time though, 
we also do need to keep an eye on the fact that we don't become super reliant on external um, help, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to solve our own problems. And at, at the moment, those traits, a self accountability and responsibility are deemed masculine traits. Mm. I don't think they should be classed masculine traits, but I know that when people, especially on the right, are saying we're losing the masculinity and masculinity isn't being respected in, in that way, that's what they're talking about. Mm. And in a way, they're right, because right now that's not where the majority of our attention needs to be spent. Mm. So there is an overemphasis on, on um, you know, reaching out and, and not having to handle everything yourself. And I think that's, that's right as well. Mm. That, that is where we need to, to be saying that it's okay to reach out for help. Mm. At the same time, we shouldn't ignore, you know, the, the other end of element of things i think what what was going on there with your coach is mentorship that's leadership correct yeah <clears throat> that that's missing a lot in our society that's right young people don't have role models they don't have enough people giving them those tough words and good advice grates on the ear as the buddha said i love that good yeah. advice grates on the ear you know people don't want to hear if i put that in the song I, i'm gonna to have to give you uh, five percent <laughs> good advice grates on the ear you That's know, wonderful. So, I've never heard that. yeah it's so important that we don't always tell people what they want to hear yeah we need to tell people what they need to hear sometimes mm. that you know tough advice is is, is important and i think that it's the dynamic between two people that yeah. comes into play there yeah. you trust him yeah. Trust it. You trust him. He, I trust he's him. Still, he's still alive, right? So yeah, you trust yeah. He's, him. he's one of my best friends. Yeah, you trust him. Yeah. And forming that rapport between two people, I think that's where good friendship comes in and mentorship comes in. Um, and that was, for me, is essential in a young person's life. And when they don't have that and they don't have a role model or a person to go to who says, no one's coming for you. No one's coming to pick you up. No one's coming yeah, yeah, to yeah, pick yeah. you up off the ground. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. This is your life. No one gives a shit about it. No one gives a shit. You know, no, I, I, no one owes you shit either. No one owes you anything. Not yeah, your yeah. family, not your parents. Yeah. You know, if you really want to make it in this world, you know, get your shit together. Yeah. That's very different from man up and 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 just Correct. put yourself together. Yes. Yeah, you're right. You know, like. Uh, but that's what's implied with man up. It is what's implied. But it's. It's a cop out though. It's a cop out and it's not specific enough. No. It's not specific enough. Yeah. Because it's also confusing. If, if someone's like man up and. And to, to you, your idea of a man is, is become stronger and eat more meat. Right. Which that, is the gender stereotypes we've created in yeah. our society. Yeah. Then that might not be useful no. for you. Because if you, if you want to cut down on your chances of having cancer, it might not be a good idea to no. eat so much meat. Or erectile dysfunction. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, another... And you, want, and you want kids and you could become, you know, sterile from testicular cancer oh that's okay I which is look into very that. much higher increase in men who eat red meat more many forms of male cancer damn. damn so there's danger in heading in those directions in these stereotypes in which men you know this gender archetype yes as a young man you're like that's the gender archetype i need to head mm. towards because if i don't head in that direction i'm not a man i'm less of a yeah. man if you wear a dress are you less of a man no if you wear makeup are you less of a man no if you have a high pitched voice, are you less of a man? No. If you're slightly effeminate, are you less of a man? <laughs> no. But then why does our society <laughs> deem men that are like that or wear those that type of pieces of fabric? Honestly, like I think it's, it's largely because we're still in, in a heteronormative um, mentality. Why though? Because most people are heterosexual. Are they? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I think so. Well, historically, yes. Uh, how do we know? That's a great question again. You know, I mean, we don't know. We, we don't. We don't. Yeah, we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure. What happens when everybody eats meat? Why do we all eat meat? Because everybody else eats meat. We all behave in a certain yeah. way because everyone else behaves in that way. There's this experiment where a young girl walks into a dentist la dentist um, office. Yeah. And there's lo there's people sitting in the room and there's a beep that goes off and she and everybody else around her stands up and then sits down and she doesn't know what's going on. And anyway, it keeps happening and everybody- I've seen this video, I've seen this, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a social experiment yeah, about yeah, how yeah. humans are primed to imitate each other. Yeah, yeah. Whether they understand it or not. Yeah. And, that, and then eventually the actors in the room are then replaced with real people who yeah. come in as well. Yeah. And they all copy each other because they, don't, they just expect that's what they need yeah. to do to fall in line. Yeah. 
And I do believe that when it comes to the way we behave, the way we present ourselves, we, we've do, we do things in these sort of mass ways because everybody else does, and that's what is safe, right? And the safety yeah. in numbers. But it's, a, it's such a fun, fascinating thing, and obviously it taps into, you know, something that you're very passionate about, which obviously is mental health. Yeah. And how, you know, we do need to, and we've talked a bit about, like, preserving mental health and how important yeah. it is. You're, ambassador, you're an ambassador for Calm, Campaign right. Against Living Miserably. I'm yeah. a huge fan of the charity. I volunteered for it oh, awesome. over the years. Um, and it's a, and tell us a little bit about it and why you're a, a supporter of it. Yeah. Um, so I had always said I wanted to like try and do something for, for charity because, you know, we spend the majority of our time trying to like uh, develop things in our own lives. But at the same time, it's super important to, to give back and, and try and be useful. I think just to have that balance is is, is a good thing. Mm. And mental health is something which I've struggled with myself. Um, and I've struggled with anxiety and depression. And I was very fortunate enough to be able to go to therapy. And I learned about mindfulness. I also had friends and family around who were able to, to help me through those very difficult times. But some people don't have that. Mm. And I think that, you know, having someone to talk to, someone who cares and someone who, uh, an organization that, that is gonna put out information about mental health and, and try to help people have a better relationship with it. That's a really great thing. And so I, I really wanted to support them. Um, I also, I, I mean, this is the, the cynical side of me. I've never actually said this before, but I, I'm aware that a, a, a proportion of, um, any like charity funds is 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 sent towards fundraising, mm -hmm. right? And I thought Calm had the best like fundraising like uh, videos as well, like content. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, if a portion if if a portion has to be given to fundraising, um, I'd like to do it through through Calm because I thought you know mm -hmm. the 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 content that they put out as well as the the general thing towards mental health that they had mm -hmm. was brilliant and also you know really valuable it is as well it's such a incredible charity because it really dives to the heart of <clears throat> what is a hidden epidemic that's going on in our society today mm. um suicide is the single biggest killer of men under 55 mm. um more than any single type of cancer around a rugby team of men you know every single day mm. in the uk some almost eight thousand a year that's a lot of people um yeah. using their lives why why do you think that is why why do you think why do you think men uh because of everything we just talked about that they yeah. the, this gender binary that is enforced on us as children hmm. creates so much emotional suffering because men are not allowed to be emotional beings right they are not allowed to express themselves they're not allowed to cry they're not allowed to show emotion they have to be strong they have to be together they have to be rich they have to be this that and all these things and it creates this huge weight. Mm. And a lot of men when they reach their 30s or have kids and they're working a job and they're coming home and they're feeling the pressure of the mortgage and all these different things, mm -hmm. you know, it gets too much and they don't have a way out because they have no support network. Mm. Women by and large have a huge, mostly have a big support network of friends they talk to all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Women are conditioned to and are allowed and given permission to, to cry, to break down, to mm. be emotional. They're allowed to do it. Yeah. Because and on the on on the other side of that, you know, men use that against women often. Stop being a woman. Stop being emotional. Stop being like that. Yeah. You know, I'm a man. I'm not like that. You yeah. know, and and that's my theory. That's there's obviously one yeah. aspect. There's I think, I think that's reasons, that's but, uh, one element, but is is a huge element. Yeah. Um, I think that also there is uh, a real crisis of like meaning and purpose. Yeah. Uh, which I, I I definitely felt in in the lockdown period uh mm. you know having a bit more time where i wasn't busy doing stuff and and i actually had time with my thoughts i definitely i was like okay you know what it what what is valuable and, mm. and what is meaningful mm. in this life and i feel like a, a lot of the time you know those kind of thoughts aren't addressed no, uh, as, as much and you know even if you look at like chat shows from i don't know the 70s or something they'd have someone like bertrand russell just like on a chat show talking about <laughs> philosophy and stuff. And, mm. you know, you would never have that now. Okay, maybe you have like Stephen Fry uh, talking about things who I love. Um, but like so many, I think because we, 
because complex ideas, uh, which might be more meaningful to fewer people, mm. um, aren't valued uh, in terms like financially valued mm. and valuable to to, to companies. Um, we see less of of those kind of ideas being being put put forward into the world, and and I suppose podcasts are the way that you can mm. still have that. But um, I, I I really feel as though there is a a crisis of something deeper and and more meaningful that uh, like pe people are experiencing that they are. Um, at the moment b because things are happening so fast, especially on social media. And the actually, world's changing so some, quickly. Something I want to say. Um, when we were talking about mental health before was that um, the the most popular forms of media at the moment are, you know, social media. So like uh, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, mm. and there are character limits, ca character limits, and also limits on people's attention. Uh, people's attention spans are becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. And so when we're thinking about the the messages that really need to be heard right now, they are not nuanced at They're all. Not. Yeah. And there's no space for nuance. And if I was the person creating the message, which has to be effective on Instagram or TikTok, I wouldn't have space for nuance either. Mm -hmm. So right now, I, f I feel like that is also a big problem with the conversation around mental health is that it, it's completely unnuanced. And, you know, that's probably why the people, you know, who are, very on the right are getting a bit annoyed mm. uh, with the, the kind of lack of uh, mention of any of the values that they would feel are important towards mm. self-esteem as well and mental health. Yeah, there's an interesting conversation around cancel culture mm. and social media <clears throat> and the intersection between that and also respectful dialogue. Mm. There doesn't seem to be much of an opportunity for people to have respectful dialogue because everything is so reductionist and simplified. Yeah. There is no space for nuance. Um, have you ever experienced being cancelled? Have you have any friends who've had ex experience being cancelled? And by what and, and also what's your opinion of it? The way people sort of, you know, someone might say something that they obviously mm. maybe later regret or maybe not. And, you know, the whole internet shuts them down, deplatforms them, kicks them out, you know, cancels them. Right. So, so I, I haven't experienced um, being cancelled. Uh, I'm trying to think if I know. I, I remember there was someone who... Uh, I remember came to one of my shows and they were so they were so um animated at the show i just remember them mm. and they became um quite senior on at a magazine i'm, I'm not gonna say which one mm. um but they got cancelled uh, for something they'd said seven years prior mm. um and even though they you know said that those thoughts didn't uh, represent them anymore mm. it was done right and the the potential profits of the magazine uh, were harmed so much so that they simply had to get rid of that person. Wow. Um, and I think that there are, of, of course, there's a place for accountability. Mm. Um, but I think there's also, there also needs to be a place for forgiveness. Mm. And there needs to be a shift from our, pers our perspective, perspective right now, which is that everyone needs to be perfect and needs to have always been perfect. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't see that as beneficial as a because the internet doesn't forget does it it doesn't forget no mm. um or forgive for that matter no uh but I, but i think to to if, if we're trying to think about which um which traits and characteristics we want to incentivize mm. a good one would be to be learning all the time mm. and to be able to put ourselves out there to you know to to have conversations on a public forum which mm. have the capacity to actually learn something from mm. so for example in this conversation right now I may say something which is wrong. In fact, I've, I'm, I've definitely, I would have definitely said something which is wrong or might offend someone. And I think a, a beautiful thing is that someone can show me where where I might be better to, to you know, to have a different perspective on. Yeah. And I might learn something. Right. And I, I feel like the expectation to have always uh, known right. what you're supposed to know mm. is unrealistic and unhelpful. And we can't we can't get it right all the time right no no and, and also that there'll be you know um people oftentimes are, are getting cancelled for something which was the the norm hmm. let's say it's like 10 years ago and they didn't know that it wasn't the norm because no one told them it wasn't the norm then and 
So for example, I, I don't think that should be something that people get canceled for. Um, for example, right now we're having a conversation about counsel, can, cancel culture. Mm -hmm. And if the term cancel culture becomes offensive in 10 years time, mm -hmm. I don't think either one of us should get canceled for saying for the word about. cancel culture. <laughs> because right now the term cancel culture is acceptable to mm -hmm. use in society now. Right. Um, it's, it's contextual, right? And I think that's often what the conversation is missing. You talk about nuance on social media. When yeah. you have such a small amount of space to talk about something, there isn't the nuance to go into the history of the conversation or the history of the word, you know, a racism and sexism, mm. you know, all these isms. They have very dark and sort of, you know, uh, insidious histories in this country. Mm. There's a lot of really, really awful things that have happened in, in the United Kingdom or the empire. There's yeah. lots of statues across this country which are deeply entwined with um you know racism slavery etc and you know many people believe they should be teared down and and or put in museums or locked away and it's been a very hot debate between these things and you know at the end of the day we're in a very diverse culture and i believe that there's nothing wrong with offending people there's nothing wrong with upsetting people in your language and what you say but i think that intent you know is everything your, your song about being kind oh, to yeah, others on talk about that you know yeah you know, sometimes people talk about being kind and it becomes a bit of a meme, but, you know, kindness um, is the lifeblood of our humanity. That mm. is what humanity, in my view, that's what humanity is. Um, do you want to talk a bit about your song, actually? Yeah, it, that, that, that was, um, so, so I, I was in LA and I'd just seen um, Caroline Flack mm. uh, uh, that right. just passed away. And a big part of that was, uh, you know, the abuse that she was receiving online. Right. And um, and it really it, it really upset me because you know I don't know the full ins and outs of of, of her mm. uh, her situation at the time, but I just I can't see how you know other people like piling in on her made their life any better. Mm. Um, you know, it, 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 I don't think any of them any of the people piling on thought that you know their words were going to end in end someone's life essentially. Right and it all I, adds up though doesn't it, it it does um but but it also you know while that really affected me it also made me think about how there are so many kind of ideas floating around in the world and and i think it's a good idea for us to to be respectful mm. of of other people's perspectives in the hope that we might learn something or we might be able to teach them something but we will only teach them something if we're respectful of their perspective mm. and, and, try, and try to you know, have them feel heard mm. and actually start a, 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 a conversation. At the same time, there was also a song, the song was also about how it was just a statement of intent to, mm. to treat people with kindness, um, regardless of their ethnicity, their sexuality. Um, and and for that, I was I was really grateful that I got the opportunity to, mm. to put a song out that was about that. Mm. Um, yeah, your music obviously is a big, is you know, it's a central part of your life. And you know, tell us a little bit about like the moment you realized, wow, what I'm doing, what I love, is you know, it's taking me somewhere. Like, what mm. was that big moment? Was there an, an individual moment that you remember where you were like, this is it, it's happening, <laughs> it's happening? Um, or was it a gradual thing? It, it has been a gradual thing, but there's yeah. been some really kind of standout moments. I remember the first um, solo track I put out was called These Are The Days and Mr. Jam played it on mm -hmm. uh, on One Extra, BBC Radio One Extra. Mm -hmm. And- um, What'd that feel like? Oh, I was so nervous, <laughs> so, so nervous. And um, he played it once and he's like, when is this nice, we play it twice. Oh, wow. And then he played it again and I was like, oh my God, this is oh. amazing. And then after he's like, when it's this nice, we play it thrice. And I was like, this guy thinks I'm good. That's so cool. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it was just, uh, it was a really kind of affirming moment. I think the, the other thing, there's been so many other, like so many moments, uh, but I think playing the Roundhouse in London. Um, I was there. You were. Yeah. Um, did you have a good time? I did. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, imagine if you're like, not really. It was, it was shit. Your shit. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was that was pretty cool because I grew up in in like Northwest London, mm. and I would you know go past the Roundhouse all the time, see who was playing, and I also when I was like 15, 16, mm. I used their um, 
they had like a charity element of, mm -hmm. of the roundhouse, which was dedicated to um, young people uh, who wanted a place to, you know, record and, you know, didn't have the means at the time. And I kind of w fell under that bracket mm -hmm. and I would go to the roundhouse's um, uh, like writing rooms and just write songs and oh. have a place to go. And I never knew that about that yeah, place, it's incredible. Y you pay, I think it was uh, 14 to 24, uh, or 25 or something mm. and um you just give them a pound when you go in and uh yeah which i don't know well, it's just so token yeah, yeah a little yeah. token yeah um, literally a, a token well wow. um and yeah you have like an hour or two to 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 write sometimes to record amazing um and to actually then you know do a show at that venue mm -hmm. was really cool for me to just to as a as a symbol of my progression mm. Um, that was that was really cool. Amazing. Um, showbiz is not for the faint-hearted. It's right. uh, very challenging in many mm. many ways. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, you've got a lot of fans. You've got a lot of people who come to your shows. H how has it been, sort of navigating all of that? You know, obviously, you talked about your mental health and stuff. You know, that must be an interplay. But how has it been throughout that journey? Have you had people supporting you, and, and what's that experience been like? Yeah, it's, it's been uh, <laughs> it's been a roller coaster. Um, and I've learned so much and I've, I've loved so much. There's been some amazing moments. Mm. Um, there's also been some really dark times. Mm. Um, I have loved being able to put out music and to you know have this idea of, I wanna be a musician. And then to actually like be able to go into the studio, put out music and have people like it. That's a fantastic experience. Mm. Um, and yeah, like I remember the first two EPs were just a, a crazy, a crazy time uh, working with uh, Joker, Kate Trinada, Tom Mish, people that like I never thought I'd be able to, to work with and, and, and also never probably would have thought about um, like, because when I started, I, I wanted to do kind of like Adele, <laughs> uh, Ed Sheeran, Plan B, Paolo Nutini kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I signed my first record deal, like I was exposed to electronic music and I was a fan of it, but I never, I, I didn't think that that was gonna be my, my way in. Mm. And so I, I was exposed to, let's say like Joker, for example, um, who's an amazing guy, amazing producer, uh, but he comes from like a dubstep background. Mm -hmm. And so just like being thrown in at the deep end and like with, with people that had very different life experiences to me. Um, that was really cool, getting to meet so many different people. And especially w when you're trying to develop like a bit more of a, you know, a more of like a worldview, um, music is a great tool to do that because you meet so many people. It's very difficult to kind of remain ignorant of, of different people and cultures when you're mm -hmm. exposed to it. Like I, I worked with um, Shaka in the first uh, like year or two of making music. Shaka. Yeah, um, amazing singer, writer, and producer. And he, uh, he comes from like a Caribbean background. And I never really spent that many time with, uh, with someone from that background. And, and he showed me loads of music and, uh, and food as well. Like uh, I remember he, he gave me uh, ackee and saltfish, obviously. Oh, yeah. Saltfish, you know. <laughs> uh, back then I wasn't vegan. Yeah, yeah. But like uh, opened my eyes to like different Mm. foods and stuff which I'd never had before and different types of music and Amazing. and like uh, different humor as well mm. um, and that was really cool so I, I'm, I'm really grateful that I got to experience that um, in terms of like darker times um, and in terms of my experience I actually have never spoken about this so mm. you're gonna get the exclusive um, and it's quite a big deal actually for me to talk about this I've never spoken about it before but um, when I was 21, I got diagnosed with something called otosclerosis, mm -hmm. which is deafness. Mm -hmm. So I started losing oh. my hearing when I was 21. Um, and I noticed it in my right ear first. Um, I, when I would sleep on one side, I couldn't hear the alarm clock. Mm. Um, and yeah, just like, it was a really tough, time in my life I basically lost the majority of my hearing in my right ear which as a musician mm. must have been devastating it was, yeah it was devastating mm. and so difficult 
especially when there's label pressure and pressure you put on yourself and music is hard enough. Yeah. Um, but then to also lose your hearing, mm. that was fucking difficult. Mm. Um, and it was one of the biggest reasons that I be- had anxiety and depression mm. um, because I then developed like tinnitus and yeah, well, it wasn't easy. Mm. Um, I ended up having an operation on my right ear. There's an amazing surgery, which essentially restores volume wow. uh, in your right ear. What they do is you're awake for the operation the whole time. Wow. They lift up your eardrum, mm-hmm. uh, they, they cut it, lift it up, wow. drill into your um, stapes bone oh, right. and take it out. And then they put in a bit of like plastic or metal. Wow. Uh, otosclerosis is, essen- is essentially um, when your stapes bone becomes overgrown and brittle. So the mm-hmm. vibration isn't working properly. Mm-hmm. And so they, they drill it out, put replace a new, it. replace it. You're awake the whole time though. Wow. So you're, you're, I remember, you're, you're kind of local uh, anesthetic, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Um, but you, you can still feel everything. Yeah. Um, except like you can feel the vibrations of the drill and your, your head and stuff. When your bone comes out, yeah, the room is spinning. Wow. Com- like, but completely spinning. Wow. Like, if they didn't, because that's your inner ear, right? Yeah. Where your body, yeah, um, uh, creates balance. It's like yeah. your internal gyroscope. Yeah. So. <laughs> So I remember, and the reason you're awake is because when they put the bone back in, mm. he's then like, can you, the surgeon's like, can you hear me? Wow. And you need to be able to say yes. Shit. You um, have to be conscious. You right? have to be conscious. So anyway, have the operation. There's a six week uh, recovery mm. time where um, they, you know, they stuff your ear with stuffing mm. stuff, not the stuff you eat, <laughs> like pack it in. Um, and then when it comes out, you're supposed to be, you know, good to go mm-hmm. and they say it only takes two weeks before you can then go back to work mm-hmm. now what they didn't tell me was um going back to work means v- very different things to mm-hmm. you know different people um i actually couldn't hear pitch for six months well wow. so if you imagine trying to write music and trying to record music mm-hmm. while not being can't able to notes. can't you can't hear the notes mm. But what your other ear, your left ear? My left ear was um, was fine right. at the time, uh, mm. but I actually have it in both ears. Right. So I have a, 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 an, an ear that's been operated on, mm. uh, where I've basically had to learn how to hear pitch again. Wow. Um, your brains had to rewire. Had to rewire. It's mm. still not as good as it was, mm. um, because I, I I'd be classed as a skilled listener mm-hmm. uh, because of what I do for yeah work and stuff, and um, and then. Yeah, just kind of dealing with that and that kind of adjustment period mm. um, where things still aren't perfect. I also can't tell where noise is coming from in my right, right ear. Mm-hmm. And I also have tinnitus 20, 24-7. Wow. So the, the process of, of dealing with that and mm. um, kind of coming to terms with it was very traumatic. And mm. it, it, it was, yeah, that there were times where I was just like, what the... F- what's the point in mm. living because mm. I want to make music for a living and now right. I can't do that. Don't I'm, glad any... that you have <laughs> I'm glad that you have continued, Zach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, me you too. You do have a gift. <laughs> like, Thanks, man. If anyone hasn't seen Zach on stage, you, you have such an incredible energy and like spirit. You're channeling a lot of the greats in, your, in, you, you in who you are. And I remember Appreciate when I first that. saw you, um, you know, that your voice, you've got such a powerful voice and you know, your passion for what you do really, really shines, um, you know, despite the challenges that you've had. And, you know, someone said to me recently that empathy and compassion mm. often is born out of suffering. I agree with that. And that, you know, when we suffer as people, um, our darkest times do transform many parts of us. Um, and being an artist, and when people talk about this all the time, that some of the greatest artists in the world have had the most terrible, most challenging things in their lives. Mm. Um, do you ever see your, you know, what is an illness? Do you ever see this as a sort of source of your strength at all? Do you? Definitely. Yeah. I think from a mental health point of view, yeah. yes, because mm. the fact that I, you know, stuck around, yeah, sure. shall we say, um, and learned about mindfulness and, and, you know, spoke so openly about that experience, it meant that I, in a way I'm like, okay, if I got over that, mm. then I can get over anything. Um, one thing I also wanted to say on that is that my left ear, um, 
is now also deteriorating mm. and i don't want to have the operation because there is that kind of risk uh there's a risk that you lose your hearing entirely mm. but there's also the process of then having to readjust and mm. learning pitch and it might not ever come back mm. even though i'd be able to hear volume so i actually wear a hearing aid mm. um and i started wearing it more in the past like um year or so and kind of on the mental health thing like thinking about that that stigma mm. as well of, of wearing a hearing aid um has been something that i've been coming to terms with in terms of my own confidence mm. and and really I, I think it's it's actually just been so useful in the same way that if someone wears glasses you wouldn't think they're weird mm. um and I, no. i'd like i'd like for us to you know have a bit of that when it comes to hearing aid right. stuff because it's been so useful for me and it means that i'm able to have you know conversations and mm. and make music uh without not you know asking people to repeat everything our it's quite nice. that's the thing about technology is that mm. you know many people don't see our technology as an extension of us we carry our mobile phones around us with us almost with an incessant obsession mm. and but they are an extension of they may sort of be external to our bodies but <clears throat> the microphone that we're talking into, yeah. the earphones that we're using, the way we communicate over the internet, you know, these are all extensions of us as people. Mm. Um, and, you know, technology can really like give us a new lease of life, can't it? And, you know, 100%. You know, you know, hearing aids, cochlear implants. Would you ever be able to have a cochlear implant? No, so th that's my, my cochlear implant. So, so my cochlear yeah. um, is fine. Right. It's, it's, so it's a diff totally different, different part of the different ear. Different part of the ear. Right. Um, and I always saw them as like a bionic ear, those things. I thought, oh, cool is that? It like <laughs> yeah, I, I think that the good thing is that, you know, if I ever didn't want to make music anymore and I just mm. f appreciated having volume, yeah. I could have the operation. Right. And I can literally wait until the inevitable thing, which mm. my, I will lose all hearing in my left ear, wow. guaranteed, pretty wow. much. Um, and I can wait until the moment I lose everything mm. before then getting the operation. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, I just want a hearing aid so I can to maintain maintain and, yeah. and and i'm okay with it what what keeps you going because obviously this is a lot for someone <laughs> you know your age to have yeah. to deal with yeah you're um, a young man and like you know there's a lot of pressure on your shoulders like how do you um keep your shit together as your as together. your uh, as your mentor said to you <laughs> um honestly i think making music um mm. you know feeling as though i'm i'm making good music and and uh, like when people DM me and they're mm. like, oh, this, this song helped me in this time in my life and this yeah. one helped me. Like that means so much. And it's like, okay, like mm. I am doing something good. And that makes me feel really good about myself. Um, the other thing is when you experience like something going wrong in your life and like I say, it's like a health thing and you talk to people about it, you realize other people have things that they're dealing with and they just don't talk like no. that. And you wouldn't know. Right. Like, most people have experienced something where you're like, fucking hell, that is mm. ridiculous. Mm. But you're just getting on with things. And mm. I, I think the thing that I was really aware of throughout the thing, throughout the whole process was how, how human beings are able to adapt, you know, to the most fucked up shit. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and when they can adapt and they ride the storm, it does make them stronger. Um, you, downstairs, we were talking about viruses mm -hmm. and how, you know, they essentially, you know, if people can survive through a virus, mm -hmm. they're then stronger. Right. I think the most productive perspective for me to have on it is that it's a, a test. Mm -hmm. And I, I like thinking about yeah. things in terms of competition, <laughs> being a table tennis player, it makes sense to me. I'm like, okay, right now I've been given this, you know, this test, mm -hmm. which I love the challenge of, of overcoming and I have overcome it. Um, mm -hmm. My first album was made um, while I couldn't, hear pitch in the same way I could mm. before and I made some of the best music I think I've ever made in my life mm. and um and I love that challenge in in a way it's it's kind of I almost think of it as like it's like almost like Paralympics for music mm -hmm. you know it's like okay I might not I might not be able to be exactly as I as I was previously but I can still be really fucking productive and, mm. and and effective in the things that i i put my mind to mm. and okay maybe I, I would have decreased in terms of hearing but i've increased in terms of compassion and mm. mental health and 
And so there's some amazing opportunities which, which have come from it. Mm. Um, it's very transformative. Moving on to a bit more into, into your music, one of mm. my favorite songs of yours, which is just a bit of fun, I know, which is the one about vegan. being vegan. <laughs> the yeah. girl that you meet pretended to be vegan. <laughs> Obviously, you say on stage, it's not a true story. It's not a true story. But um, well, you know, where did the idea from that come from? Because it's quite, it's quite a comedic song. But yeah. you know, people love it because it's so funny and silly. But there's a, there's a sort of, you know, talking about identity, there's, mm. a, there's a kind of message in that, right? Where, about identity and about pretending to be something that you're not <laughs> yeah. just to get what you want. <laughs> I never thought I'd be analyzing the song in a deep way. Um, yeah, I, I suppose so. Um, the song came about from from me literally just sitting on a train thinking about just stupid song ideas. What if? <clears throat> yeah, what if you wrote a song about how uh, you, you know, you'd been hard done by by a girl saying that she was vegan just to get with you. Mm -hmm. um, it just made me laugh. And so I remember bringing it into the studio and I was like, guys, I want to write about this today. and at first I thought I was joking and then they were like, I was like no, 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 this is, this is the shit. Mm. This is what we're going to write about. And they were down. It's so hard to write about veganism and music because mm. without it sounding cheesy yeah, preachy. or preachy yeah, yeah. or evangelical, there's yeah. a lot of people that send us their music all the time. And, it, and you know, obviously they're beautiful songs, but a lot of the time they, they sound like something you sing in church. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, and you, I feel like you've really captured the essence of, you know, um, your kind of, your view of it, right? Mm. Which is about like just accepting yourself and you know, this is who I am. And <laughs> yeah. you know, if you're going to pretend to be somebody else, then <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't even go that deep with it. T to me, it was just like, it's a funny song idea. Yeah. And, but it has the, impact though. But, that's but, the but thing. That's like, the, thing. The, the most, imp I think yeah. the most effective, there, there's many ways of getting a message across. Yeah. I think humor and that's comedy I'm saying, is yeah. a really effective way of doing that where just I'm saying, without yeah, yeah. realizing it, singing about something yeah. as important as veganism <laughs> in such a funny, yeah. fun way, yeah. you get to talk about it on stage in yeah. front of hundreds of people. And it doesn't piss anyone off. Absolutely. <laughs> Which is genius. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> no, thank you for uh, also like sharing it and, uh, and yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm awesome. a big Thank fan of, of <laughs> my pleasure. I'm a big fan of using comedy to talk about serious things because it's mm. disarming. Yes. That, you know, yeah. life is hard, right? Yeah. It's We're, also really funny. It is also funny. There's some silly things that go on, but we've got to laugh sometimes because if we don't laugh, we're going to just end up crying all the time. Yeah. Right. We're going to be depressed and miserable. Life on earth is yeah. not easy for, yeah. no, for none of us. You know, obviously some are more privileged than others, of course. Um, but ultimately, you know, we do need to use, we need, do need to tap into joy to be able to, um, get it, get through things. Yeah. Um, and that joy can be found even in the darkest t times, right? Definitely. Especially in the darkest times. Yeah. A wise man once said, yeah. man, I've got to laugh before I cry. <laughs> that was my song. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Sorry, I had to do it. Had no, do but it. I mean, we, we have to, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're just, we're not out of it yet, but we're living through a global pandemic. So if you're listening yep. to this in the future, you know, we're still in it. Yeah. A lot of people are taking life for granted. They think they're untouchable. Yeah. Um, and they don't realize that, you know, this virus that exists in our society, um, that virus or any other virus or a disease, it's mm. never going to come for me. I'll mm. never get cancer. I'll never have problems with my body, I'm untouchable, especially younger people, they feel invincible. Um, but as you know, as we've talked about, it's something that you've had to experience and you know, it, you're still here, thank goodness, um, making your incredible music. So thank you for sticking around, Zach. Yeah, thanks for uh, saying that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, obviously the future is bright for you. It's a, you know, so. you've, you've had some wonderful experiences, you know, I've been to, you know, a few of your shows and I see how people respond to you. Mm. Um, what does your, the future look like for you? Have you got any exciting projects that you could talk about? Well, um, what's, what's on the horizon? Yeah. So, so I'm, I have, when's this coming out by the way? Um, probably in a few weeks, three or four weeks. A few weeks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I have a song coming out, um, in the new year, uh, called good times. Mm hmm um it's a cover of the chic song good mm -hmm. times mm -hmm. uh featuring sheku kana mason okay um who's a, a good friend of mine and um i wanted to sing it in a a, a kind of more slow heartfelt way as mm. opposed to like the celebration song that it is mm. I, and that was kind of to 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 kind of think about the lyrics in a different way uh, happy days are here again mm -hmm. uh, the time is right for making friends like it really feels like hopefully you know we keep getting pulled back into lockdowns and things but hopefully we're 
coming out of that situation now and it feels like the good times are here again so mm. that's coming out in, in january sounds like something we need <laughs> yeah yeah um i like putting out you know positive messages uh, because there's a there's a lot of doom and gloom out there mm, um, is. so it's, it's it's cool to put out the opposite of that um i'll also i'm, I'm also like pretty much finished my album my second album um i'm working on the production at the moment and that's going to be coming out uh next year mm -hmm. um when you any dates yet or don't know dates for the <laughs> album but I, there's like four songs which we're uh which are basically ready to go which will be released one after the other which mm -hmm. is a really cool position to be in um previously i've always done things like very like frantically like okay this one and then okay can we do this one and mm -hmm. now we're actually getting a bit of a plan together um i also have an amazing team um i got new management uh, mm -hmm. a few months ago and I, I really love them a lot i think they're just so great mm. um at what they do and i'm close to them very like individually mm. um and uh that they didn't know each other before this but basically most of the time you either work with one manager um and that'd be kind of like a boutique kind of situation mm -hmm. or you are with a management company and the, the pro of a management company is there's you know lots of people so more more time wide in the net yeah but mm -hmm. they don't really care as much about mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. and i was very fortunate in that i was like okay i need m like maybe more people um but i also don't want to go to a management company mm. because you just kind of like get left behind and so right, lost in the mire right so I've, I've got three managers now wow and i like them all mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. and they're all brilliant but they're all completely different mm. and they didn't know each other mm. and now they all like each other as well mm. and um it's amazing and i've almost kind of got a management company that i'm working with of individuals mm. Um, so that's really exciting and having like a new team has kind of given me a lot more um, energy mm. and like I feel very positive um, mm. from that kind of new energy and that's something I'm really grateful for at the moment. Amazing. Um, also, I'm going on tour with Paloma Faith oh, wow. uh, in Paloma. June. Yeah, me too. Um, you awesome. didn't, didn't you write a song for her? I did, yeah. Uh, we did a song called I'll, I'll Be Gentle, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, was featuring John Legend as well. What's she cool. like to work with? Amazing. She's super creative mm -hmm. and such a powerful voice. She's such a magical being. Yeah. Um, also, the thing I loved about working with her was before we actually went into the studio, she sent me an email saying, I really want to talk about this. Mm -hmm. And she sent me like a list of ideas she'd been thinking of. And I was just like, okay, this woman is a, a real professional and a real artist mm. and i that really informed the way that i thought about writing sessions to mm. actually go into the room with intention mm. i learned to be prepared yeah i learned yeah. from her um and also i'm supposed to be going on a european tour in april mm -hmm. i've been told that we can't announce the european side of it but i can announce coco uh <laughs> at the end of april uh, will be the London show. So Amazing. that's going to be announced. Um, it might have already been announced by the time this comes out. Mm. Uh, but, but for COVID reasons, mm. we're not allowed to announce any of the European dates, even though they're all planned, mm. signed off. We got the venue, we got the band. Right. But I can't announce it. Mm. So I'm announcing it right now, but right. I'm not you really. You're first people. Um, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I'm very excited about that. Well, coming to the end now, I always like to ask my guest this final question. Mm. <clears throat> Zach, if you were stuck on a desert island and it was just you and a pig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have sex Obviously, with it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you're not going to eat or do anything else with a pig because you're a very compassionate young man and a vegan. If you could take one vegan dish, one music album, yeah. and one book on your desert island, what would you take with you? Okay. Um, vegan dish would be... Um, Brett Cobley, a.k.a. Epi Vegans, uh, Mushroom Tagliatelle. Very nice. Um, amazing book, by the way. He's got out called uh, What Vegans Eat. A um, little plug for you there. <laughs> uh, very good friend of mine. Used to live with him. Um, so that would be the food. The, the the second one was the, the album. Music album. Music album. Music or music album. So the music album that I would take uh, with me on this desert island is 
World Psychedelic Classics number four, Nobody Can Live Forever, colon, The Existential Soul of Tim Meyer. Uh, Tim Meyer is the absolute godfather of Brazilian funk and soul. I love how expertly delivered that was. Thank you. <laughs> I've, I've practiced this a lot. For those who are listening, I won't tell you he doesn't have his mobile phone in front of him. <laughs> yeah, I had, and, to, I had to look up the exact name. And your book, Zach, what would you take? My book. Ooh. To be honest, I'm not really a fan of reading a book again and again, again, mm. um, again, again, again. Um, but a book that I really liked is Shantaram. Mm. Um, I know it well. I love that book so much. Um, it's got so much heart and mm. soul in it. And I've been lucky enough to spend the last three Christmases uh, with my mum in India. Mm. Um, and so I fully like really appreciate like his experience and. Mm always think about that book when I'm when I'm there amazing Mr. Zach Abel thank you for joining us on the PBN podcast what thank a pleasure to me. get a little window into your life and your history hell yeah <laughs> nice having me thanks so much for joining us everyone I've been Robbie Lockie your host and this is the PBN podcast we'll be back next week with more veganism food fashion animals and everything in between <laughs>